Great. Thank, 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 thank you very much indeed. I mean, Tom, Thomas and I didn't meet uh, until earlier on today, and um, I didn't know I was going to, to uh, be the only thing that stood between you and the drinks reception. So this is a very dangerous place to be. But just of interest, if my talk becomes increasingly boring, um, if you visit the App Store and search for CHSS, um, we in the Scottish Centre for Telehealth, uh, in partnership with the Chest, Heart and Stroke Association of Scotland, uh, have an app which allows you to do the FAST test, which will demonstrate through video what facial droop looks like, slurring of speech, so that the population can actually uh, diagnose and FAST, and it tells you to dial 999. So I'll give you the nod halfway through when I know it's going to get dull, and uh, you can download it. It's free. Um, so there you go. There's not many things you get from a Scot that's free. <laughs> Trust me. Right. Eyes down, look in. Wine beckons. Okay. We've heard a lot about this today. But the reality for those of us who work within the health sector or even local authority is crisis is business as usual. But the crisis we're facing at the moment is subtly but distinctly different. Uh, we have got increasing financial challenges, and when you marry that with the demographics, the issues of long-term conditions, we have got a problem. But what does that problem actually mean? And this is what it means for me, and over the next 10 to 20 years, and don't remember the big numbers, just remember those who are requiring care are going to continue to increase, and the number able to deliver care, both formal and informal carers, um, is going to reduce. So we can either sit with our head in our, in our hands uh, or we can do something about it. And you know what? The solutions are out there. They're in front of our faces, but we still choose to ignore them. I was at a presentation in this building yesterday afternoon and I heard an esteemed colleague once again say, we need to do more randomised controlled trials. Well, indeed, he was an academic and he would say that. I'm a pragmatist. I do believe we need to continue to do research, but you know what? There are enough evidence-based findings out there to support the deployment of technology for certain conditions that are proven beyond any shadow of a doubt that they make a difference. Interestingly, I was speaking to a colleague who challenged me around about that and basically said, I have just seen a multi-centre trial for... Um, congestive cardiac failure, and you know what? It did not improve the outcomes for patients against conventional care. It was no difference, and it was said in a dis just disparaging way. I said, brilliant. That's a result, because for me, it is actually about coping with the demand and capacity challenges that we face in our health and care systems today, not tomorrow, next year, or 10 years down the track. That's where technology deployment, appropriately planned, can make a difference. The Scottish perspective is clear for everyone to see. By the end of March 2010, 180,000 people were in receipt of telecare. Uh, interestingly, a year on, um, we've now invested uh, about £20 million of funding, and the gross benefits are now circa £70 uh, plus million. Pounds. That is not real money and real savings, because we still have a huge amount of investment in buildings uh, and in staff. But we do need to move forward. So I'm not here to oversell, so let's be honest. But it has made a tangible difference, and you can read some of the outcomes and the efficiencies uh, on that slide as well as I can. But the sad tragedy is that certainly in the UK, we continue to deliver the vast majority of our health care the way we did in 1948 when the health service existed. We still go to see the doctor. We still send the patients to hospital. We will arrange for the district nurse to visit. That model is not sustainable. But I'll tell you this, when I'm sick, I want to see somebody, because I'm a man, and I need to tell you how ill I actually am. <laughs> so technology is not about replacing face-to-face -face care. It is about supporting it. 
and that is also fundamentally important. Now, in Scotland, we've got a number of enlightened clinicians. They're growing all the time. Uh, we have a learning network. We have a champions network uh, who take forward um, the deployment of uh, ICT-like solutions. And the mantra for us is anything that we do has to be safe, it has to be effective, and it has to be patient-centered. And that's our watchword in any new solution as we deploy. But not every doctor in Scotland is as gifted as Dr. Juma here. Because just remember, ICT and certainly telehealth and telecare cannot solve the problems of the world. It can actually help as part of a coordinated strategy, and our strategy in Scotland is that we will use all digital channels that are available to us to deliver appropriate care in support of face-to-face -face services. So what about Scotland? I was almost about to say that's quite an attractive cow, but that would stereotype me as well, so just <laughs> strike, strike that remark. Now, we have a national strategy for telehealth and telecare, unlike a lot of um, um, countries in Europe. Uh, we have a Scottish Centre for Telehealth and Telecare, which is an enabler, which uh, helps all our territorial health boards who are charged with delivering care for their citizens. Um, and that's important. But we also have a national government digital strategy, as, as has England. And the key for us is aligning those strategies to deliver what we need to deliver. But just remember, technology alone solves very little. The key to success is the discipline that we actually all know. It is about intelligent service redesign underpinned and supported by appropriate ICT and the whole thing absolutely resting on the fundamental which we ignore at our peril, which is education and training. Education of health and care professionals, education of service users and as importantly informal carers. Because as it is in most of the developed world, if informal carers turn their back on their role our health and care system would collapse within hours, not days or months. So funding helps, and in Scotland we have this change fund. I mentioned that uh, talk I was giving yesterday. Um, in this financial year, to the end of March, we have £70 million, which is supporting redesign and reshaping care pathways. It rises to £80 million for the year 12-13, and it will be £300 million over four years. This is in a cash-challenged system. But Scottish Government are enlightened and they believe that this investment is the way to go to allow us to have a safe, sustainable and effective health and care system. But for it to work, as I said earlier, you need supportive networks and we have uh, a critical friend called the Joint Improvement Team that challenges our health and care partnerships to work together to integrate and to become innovative. Um, and that has played huge amounts of success um, over the past few years. More recently, we have established the Scottish Assisted Living Programme. I, changed the, I chair this uh, um, very disparate group of individuals. What we've done is we brought together uh, the NHS, uh, local authorities, both our enterprise organisations. Uh, there are representatives from government sitting around the table. Interestingly enough, not just simply from health and care, but from business uh, and from housing. And also around the table, uh, we have got academics and representatives of service users and carers organisations. As a single group that is coordinating this effort going forward, it's euphemistically been called the Team Scotland approach. After particularly difficult meetings, I call it something entirely different. <laughs> but what is the key to success? It's actually about honesty. I don't know about you, but I go to meetings often with other organisations and we hedge what we say. We skirt round the problems. We decided we weren't going to do this in this group. Every organisation was asked to put up front what its givens were. What did it need to do to deliver its organisational objectives? And once we knew what they were, we could have an adult conversation about whether they were achievable or not. And in most cases, they actually were. It is a true collaboration. We also decided that we would do something that the NHS hasn't been good at. Uh, I don't know about you, but 
Having worked in the NHS since 1977, we don't only deliver health care, we actually design everything that supports health care, including become experts in building technology. And, yeah, we've got to do everything. But this time we decide we're not doing that. We'll, all organisations will play to their strengths. The enterprise organisations are managing the relationships uh, with uh, uh, ICT companies and other suppliers. Um, and we are actually only determining what the outcomes are. And that was actually quite liberating. We also said we were not going to put all our eggs in one basket. And fundamental for us is to keep things simple but really to remain realistic, because we are rolling out superfast broadband, uh, as uh, are our different parts of England, but we know it is not going to solve all our problems. But this is something you're never going to hear a speaker say for a good few months. I would personally like to thank News International and Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> The reason for that is that we have challenges with internet access. I to tell you, somebody's having hysterics in the back there. He's actually tweeting it now. Um, <laughs> we have challenges with internet access. In Scotland, if you're over 65 and you're a lower socioeconomic group, there is a fair chance that you do not have broadband in your house. But courtesy of my friend Rupert, Sky unashamedly have marketed and targeted Scotland. And in fact, 80% of all social housing in Scotland has either got Sky or Virgin. That is a huge advantage for us because it means that we can use that 42-inch flat screen television in the corner of living rooms to push and pull health information. And NHS 24 has a national uh, license for the delivery uh, of interactive digital television services on behalf of the NHS in Scotland and is live today available on your red button. Sounds a bit like an advert, eh? The moment you can make an appointment with your GP, you can order your prescriptions, you can get health information and advice. We are actually doing reviews for rheumatology patients who are housebound um, using a digital television. This is going to be a huge growth industry. We're only scra scraping the surface uh, and uh, really need to understand where its total potential is. So last time, Rupert, good man. Now, I like my ICT and technology just like the next person. But the reality is, am I going to really deploy something like this across the length and breadth of Scotland? New, innovative, shiny, cutting edge technology. No, I am not. I would much rather deploy thousands of these in support of intelligent, innovative service redesign. So this is how our thinking is setting up. In the past, we made fundamental mistakes. Um, we had kit that on one level was very impressive, but it was often fixed and inflexible and, quite frankly, not particularly attractive or especially simple. I told you we were going to learn something new during my presentation. What we didn't recognise is that service users and patients never remain static. They may, have win, they have, may have won a piece of kit because they had a long-term condition, but that long-term condition improves and deteriorates, as does the patient. But some of our solutions were not designed to take account of that. All of our solutions in the future are not about disease-specific solutions. One box for one problem. We are not going to, through the deployment of technology, keep people in the community for an extra five or ten years if they're going to be a prison behind their front door. We are looking to use platforms that people already have, know and use, from smartphones, from tablet computers, um, to digital television, um, as the way we are going to deploy uh, ICT-supported services in the future. And we are going to use a menu approach, a menu approach for healthcare interventions, but also for improving the quality of life and lifestyle um, for the user. But not just catering for the individual, but catering for the informal network round about it. Maybe even catering for the Spaniel. It is a Spaniel, isn't it? Pretty scruffy one at that. So you might actually have the uh, doggy parlour on the uh, 
on the device. Who knows? Anyway, last three minutes. Don't time me. Don't do performance management. I'm a doctor. <laughs> the one thing I like to be is open, honest, and pragmatic. <coughs> We have to balance the needs of the users and carers in, 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 in sustaining an independent lifestyle. But as important for me in the design of any of these systems and processes is we need to recognize the aspirations of the health and care teams. And we have to make sure that the control remains with the local team and as importantly with the service user and their family. But we have to get economies of scale and cost benefits. And that means in Scotland, which is a, a, is a, a nation of 5.2 million, we need to have a national support network. And the challenges about lifting that support network up to a national service is the shroud waving that happens down at local communities. And that's why that redesign is really important. And going back to the Scottish Assisted Living Programme Board, we also want to create jobs and economic opportunities for Scotland. Now, that might be motherhood and apple pie. What we're saying about technology, I'm not going to read everything out to you, but it is about keeping it simple. And the main thing for me is the last bullet point. It has to be usable with little or no training, just like this. We are moving from supportive self-management to co-production. I had to look up what co-production was. I thought it's what Hollywood did. But the reality is that if we're deploying this technology into people's homes to support long-term condition management, or indeed to support a frail, frail, vulnerable elderly person, they need to feel part of their community and active participants in their community. And in Scotland, we have this uh, program called ALICE. It's a data set which actually sets out all the local services that are available from the third sector, from voluntary sectors, for self-help organisations, uh, which people can access. But not only is it a list, they can feed into that with additional things and they can offer services that they wish to deliver towards their local community. It may be as simple as local history, it may be participating uh, in support groups through their digital television uh, as a virtual uh, network of friends. So for me, the whole thing is not about technology because we don't need to reinvent things to make a huge difference. We just need to use the technology solutions that have been around for the last five to ten years. But we need to be innovative and brave about service redesign. And if we do all of those things, we will all live happily ever after. Thank you very much.